term she. Verse 4. And Jehovah will do unto them as he did to Sihon and to Ob, the kings of the Amorites, and unto their land whom he destroyed. And Jehovah will deliver them up before you. And he shall do unto them according to all the commandment which I have commanded you. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be affrighted at them. For Jehovah thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Hallelujah. We can stop right there. I'm going to look at one particular verse, and then we're going to go on. The Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorite. The Amorite kingdom was a powerful kingdom, Israel. Mm -hmm. There are two branches to the Amorite kingdom. Mm -hmm. There's the eastern branch with Hammurabi, and there's the western branch known as the Hyksos in Egypt. So just before the era of the exodus and redemption that we know, um, there were a people that were ruling in Egypt that were not native Egyptians. These were the people who were ruling Egypt when Joseph came to the throne. This is why after Joseph dies, it says, now a new Pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph. We're talking about a very specific king. His name is Amos I. And Amos I drove out the Hyksos regime and empire. And he had no respect for them and the prior aristocracy and monarchy. So, of course, they knew who Joseph was, but he had no respect for them. So, I'm saying to you in this moment is what's interesting when you check the historical record is that when the western branch of the Amorite kingdom was pushed out of Kemet or Egypt due to the king, first king of the 18th dynasty, whose name is Amos I, when he breaks through and gets them out, they don't go all the way back to the far east. They go to the land of Israel and settle and dwell there. That's why you find an Amorite branch in the land of Canaan. And we must know this history because you might be thinking that Amorites were always there and that's not the case. The term Amorite is Amori in the text, but they're known as Amu in the historical record. And the, the term Amu, as used by the Egyptians to refer to the Amorites, was a blanket term. They began to describe all Semitics that way. Mm -hmm. So you can see inscriptions in Egypt where Israelites are described as Amu. Want an example? Cop shoots a black guy. Bad example. But it's the example of this country. Mm -hmm. The black guy is from America. Before he shoots the black guy, pow, pow, N-word. Okay. Next day, same time, he shoots another black guy, pow, pow, N-word. But this black guy, he's from East Africa. Is there some type of blood relation possibly? Yeah, yeah, maybe. The term N, the N-word, becomes a blanket term used by other ethnicities to describe all of us. They don't care your creed, your nationality, all of y'all is the N-word. In ancient Egypt, the term Amu, which is their way to say Amorite, became a blanket term. All of y'all are that. And I want to share that with you so that now you can go behind the scenes and begin to study that history because in studying the Amorite empire, you're going to see so much of the Tanakh come alive. Tumshi. Verse 7. And Moshe called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage. But thou shalt go with this people into the land which Jehovah have sworn unto their fathers to give them. And thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And Jehovah, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee. Neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Hallelujah. Let's stop there. What is Moses doing? I heard it mentioned this morning. Someone said, pass the baton. What is the idea inherent in passing the baton? Do I give you the baton so you can keep running? Or do I give you the baton so that you can pass me? What's the relationship between parent and child and teacher and disciple in the Tanakh? The same. That's why you have to have the same respect for your teachers that you have for your parents. In case we don't know. The sons of the prophets that we read about in the Bible were not their sons. They were the disciples. But the Tanakh says the sons of the prophets. 
because the relationship between parent and child, teacher and disciple, is one. So what are we talking about? What do I want to emphasize in this moment? There is no parent that desires that their child just do what they did. None. Every parent desires that their child surpass them. So why is it that we as leaders or as teachers don't keep the same energy? What, what they call them out there? What's she known as? Psst, yeah, whatever. These be your teachers that don't want to see you go out and do even greater things. How far the ball and the baton has been dropped when the leadership and the teachers don't desire that the next generation surpass them. That is the golden standard. We fail somewhere if this generation doesn't go further than the generations that came before us. Let's go and talk about our Rabbi Matthews, our amazing elders that laid this foundation. And let's ask ourselves some honest questions right now. What institutions did we build to surpass what they established? You see why Moses is making this appeal? Because the generation he spoke to then is the same generation we're speaking to right now. Stagnant. Got all this knowledge, but what the hell are you doing with it? You got a problem with, oh, why, why she doing that? Oh, he doing too much. Why he doing that? <clears throat> what are you doing? Nothing you'll notice that the people who always ain't involved with nothing got the most to say about something. <laughs> I'm not going to say, let, let all who are without sin cast the first stone. I'm not that kind of Israelite. Shots fired at who said that, if y'all know what I'm saying. I'm not that kind of Israelite. But I'll tell you this. You should have enough moral and spiritual etiquette to know if you don't got no work, you the last one to be speaking about who doing what with work. Hello? Tom Shea. Verse 9. And Moshe wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Lewi, that bore the ark of the covenant of Jehovah, and unto all the elders of Israel. And Moshe commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, in the set time of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel has come to appear before Jehovah thy God in a place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, the men, and the women, and the little ones, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn and fear Jehovah your God, and observe to do all the words of this law. Stop right there. Powerful. Moshe was commissioned to galvanize the entire congregation, the entire community, all of Am Yisrael. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it takes all to make this work. So if we're behind the scenes discussing those key elements that's necessary for community, and we're not involving all aspects of the community, we are failing. Even the children have to have jobs in the nation. We speak about nation, right? Mm -hmm. Even the children have to have jobs. There's something that you have to do. When everybody's busy doing something, work is being done. Progress is being met. But if we hallelujah and shouting, and year after year repeating the same cycle, you ever seen the movie, I think it's Groundhog Day? I tell you this with all humility. Sometimes you look out in the world, the general world that you live in, and it's like Groundhog Day. What George Bush Sr. was doing back then, his son did, and they doing now, Groundhog Day. America's policy towards black people from its inception is the same from then till now, Groundhog Day. 
the look of the Hebrew Israelites in the Israelite community is beautiful as ever. That's a good Groundhog Day. But the lackluster work ethic is not acceptable. Groundhog Day. What are we doing? Do you know the power of one able-bodied man? And when I say man, Israel, I include the family. Do you know the power of one able-bodied man and what they're able to do? So could you imagine two, three, four, five, six, seven? Talk to me. The creator took Noah because he said, I have found that there was none righteous but him. He saved the whole world for his sake, for our sake. If one man can save a universe, then what's the strength of an Israelite congregation? Somebody please talk to me. We have too much knowledge, too much know-how to not have enough application. Part of the issue that we do see in our communities is that we don't have enough open dialogue. And I say that as a layman because I am not as involved in this community as I need to and should be. But hold on, we need more people to say that too. Because can I come up here and talk about what I don't see and what I'm not perceiving? And I'm not knocking on doors and saying, hey, what can I do? So it goes full circle. We all could do better. And it starts here. Tom Sheik. And that their children who have not known may hear and learn to fear Yehoah your God as long as ye live in the land whether ye go over the Jordan to possess it. Verse 14. And Yehoah said unto Moshe, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting that I may give him a charge. And Moshe and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting. And Yehoah appeared in the tent in the pillar of cloud. And the pillar of cloud stood over the door of the tent. And Yehoah, Stop right there. Stop mm -hmm. right there. Slackly. Stop right there. What's interesting as we're watching this unfold is that Moshe is literally setting up Joshua to be the next person mm -hmm. before the eyes of the congregation and before the creator of heaven and earth. And what's interesting about that is we should all be taking notes. I'm going to be hard on us. And I'll say this. At one point do we wake up in our 30s, at least, 40s and 50s, and realize you're that next generation. Now, are you waiting for somebody that's in their 80s to step off the podium for you to start doing work? We are that next generation now. By the time you decide that you're ready, you're not ready. You're not even relatable. The young boys not checking for you no more because you lost your relatability. Seize these moments while you still have some feasible relatability because once you lose it, it's gone. Old young boys that tell you quick, we're not checking for what you're saying, old head. And they so crazy with it, they calling us old heads from our 30s. <laughs> Walked in the store the other day, put up old timer. Word? That's how you feeling? <laughs> My son know me, he laughing, because I'm green light, I'm always on go. But you can't be like that as an Israelite. You have to improve yourself. So I'm usually just very observant, like, oh yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Thank God for growth, I gotta tell you that. Thank God for growth. What I'm noticing in this passage for me is that in order to have a successful future generation of leaders, there has to be a smooth enough transition of leadership. Absolutely. We have to really become more involved in wanting to see a smooth transition of leadership because I gotta tell you and I gotta be honest, once you reach a certain age, most people ain't checking for you. Mm. 
and I'm telling you that. And if you lose your relatability, it don't matter how powerful and how wise your words are, they're not checking for you. One of the greatest speakers in our modern era is none other than the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. But how many of the younger generation is checking for him? Some of us, many of us, even as Israelites know, when the Most High calls that man, some of us going to drop tears. You know why? Be spiritually mature. While he may not have spoke directly and always out the Tanakh, many a times he spoke the words of Tanakh. Somebody talk to me. He stood with some amazing elders among us, Ben Ami. He called for something that was named and termed the Million Man March. But what did we do? <laughs> Gathered a million people on the lawn, but what did they do? But, but what did you do? But, but what did you do? We are so prideful that we don't even know how to take notes. Because if we've been really taking notes, the Israelite Million Man March would have happened already. I say in this moment that one of the most impactful blessings about the reading of the Tanakh and the Torah is how honest and transparent the text is. As great as Moses is, it tells us that he was not allowed to come into the land because he smoked the rock. I'm glad y'all didn't co-sign me on that because that's that Christian talk. Moses didn't come in the land because he started speaking French. He says, shall we? <laughs> we? We who? And I mean that with all due respect because Moses will still go down right now, blessed be his memory, as one of the very best we ever produced. So I say that respectfully. But the creator said, because you did not sanctify my name. So as Israelites, we got to be careful. In our communities, we are divided in, in I'm going to just say it, religious views. No, we don't believe in religion. Some of us got religion. Religion is when you're not moving in the spirit properly. It becomes religion. We separate in our religious views. And we mad at one community because they don't accept who you say is the Messiah. And we mad at another community because you do accept. When all of us have people in our community that move like they the Messiah and some of y'all run with it like they are too. So how we look? Crazy. How do we look? Crazy. I say that to say this Parsha and Moses went, is going to be followed by Ha'azinu. Give ear. Give ear. Ozen. Ozen in Hebrew forms another word. Maizan. Moznaim. Balance. If you're not giving heed or ear, you don't have spiritual equilibrium. You don't have balance. Tumshi. Verse 16. And Yehoah said unto Moshe, Behold, thou art about to sleep with thy fathers, and his people will rise up and go astray after the foreign gods of the land, whether they go to be among them and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall come upon them, so that they will say in that day, are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evil which they shall have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods. Now, therefore, write ye this song for you, and teach thou it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them in the land which I swore unto their fathers, 
flown with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten their fill, and waxen fat, and turned unto other gods, and served them, and despised me, and broken my covenant, then it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles shall come upon them, that this song shall testify before them as a witness. You can stop right there. I just want to comment on one particular term, and then we're going to move on. Throughout the Torah, the land of Israel is described as milk and honey, the land flowing, right, with milk and honey. Why? Another thing we often discuss in some of the online classes we do, we say jokingly, what are they saying in the Israelite community about the Bible today? Because the interpretation of the Tanakh changes by week. So jokingly, we say, what are they teaching about this passage today? So I asked the class not too long ago, what are they saying about this usage of milk and honey today in the Israelite community? And one person stood up and said, they saying that it's bad because milk is bad. The amount of doctrines that are born in the Israelite community by the day is, is, wow. So the Tanakh says milk for sure, and it really means milk. Mm -hmm. But we studied, with all due respect, Dr. Sabi and everybody else that's amazing with health. And because of their research and criteria, <laughs> we now want to edit the Tanakh because that shouldn't have said milk. And if it said milk, then that's wrong. <laughs> Just like we're not going to eat no meat come Pesach because the Most High definitely didn't say we could eat meat, Ak. They call me the troublemaker for a reason. <laughs> How, Sway? Milk strengthens and honey heals. Mm. The land of Israel is curative. The land of Israel is not just our spiritual asylum, but it's also our medicine cabinet because milk strengthens the body, your bones, your marrow, which goes out to all parts and brings and introduces life. Honey is curative. They also say in this week in the Israelite community, and I say this week because it might change next week, that honey's bad. They call it B. Zoak today. They use the other word, y'all know. That's interesting. Well, I'll tell you this. As for me and my household, we shall serve the true and the living God, and we will do as he spoke and he commanded. I'm not remixing the text. I'm not reinventing it. I'm not shifting and moving it. I'm looking at what it says and I'm moving within it because I put my trust in God and God alone and I don't care what y'all saying today. 